What I really wanted to do this morning was test how durable this stand was. I brought this Bible with me and it's, yeah, pretty hefty. So it's a four version comparison, so it's pretty great. If you wanna take a look at it, you can be my guest. How are we this morning? Okay, not convinced, but that's okay. Um, I'm about there too. It's been a long week, it's been a busy week and you probably noticed we have a, uh, we also have a middle school camp going on right now, so it's been an exciting week. Um, but when Mr. Bergen invited me to share with you all as part of this week, um, I was really, I was just really honored and excited. Uh, I don't often get to share with you in this kind of a context, and so um, it's an honor and a joy. If we haven't met yet, my name is Lauren Holland. I am the student life director here at the Chahi Summer School of Music, and it's been such an honor and a privilege to serve in this role the last eight, nine years I lose track. Um, I've been in leadership at Chahi since 2009, and I started actually at Chahi. My very first Chahi exposure was when I was 13 years old. Um, it was the summer of 1999. And I desperately, actually it was even before summer, it was probably early spring, I decided that I had heard my parents talk about it for long enough because they were counselors here back in the 80s uh, with some other wonderful people in this room. And I had heard so much about it that I thought, okay, it's time, it's time. I'm going to private school in the fall where my dad teaches, it's time for me to do this. And um, the Lord opened a lot of doors. We couldn't afford it. I'm one of six kids. And uh, my grandmother actually lived about a half hour away. And so she's very much part of my, my story in getting me here. And I'm so glad she stepped in because I haven't had a summer without it since, um, which isn't really about me at all. It's just, it's about the story that God's writing for me and for all of you. Um, and I'm just so, just so grateful to be part of it. Um, so I have some thoughts uh, to share with you. The Lord has been doing a lot in my heart. It has been a really weird year in my family. Um, I actually live in Denver, Colorado, Colorado, Colorado. Um, and I grew up in New Jersey, so Jersey girl at heart, but uh, I have had a long kind of a zigzag path. Um, during a summer here, actually, summer 2010, um, I don't know if you've had any experience like this, but sometimes God asks you to do something and you're like, what? <laughs> like, that sounds great and all, but really? Um, I had just finished a master's degree in piano performance, and I thought I was gonna go start a teaching studio, start some performing. I had some ideas and dreams about a career, and God was like, actually, I want you to go to Germany, and I want you to go teach and work and do all kinds of exciting things at the Black Forest Academy. And I thought I was signing up for a two-year commitment, um, but then that turned into 10. And then uh, June 2021, I moved back to the U.S. and came back for, actually, I came back for Chehi every summer. Met most of you during those, uh, those years. And, uh, uh, sorry, I get it a little confused. It was a little bit crazy. Uh, June 2021, I moved home. I moved back to the U.S. And then in Ju January of 2022, I moved to Denver. I'd never been there before. And um, I'm a student, actually, again, in this season of life. I'm studying counseling at Denver Seminary. Um, we also we have some pretty great friends that uh, have gone there. If you know Wesley White or have heard of his name this week at all, he got his doctorate of ministry there. So it's a very special place for me in a lot of, a lot of ways. And I'm making my own memories there. So a little bit about me. Um, I have so many similarities with your stories. I was sitting at breakfast this morning thinking about that. Um, I'm a daughter. I'm a friend. I'm a sister. I'm a firstborn. Anybody else? Okay, awesome. Um, I'm really grateful. I said friend, the word friend already, but I'm grateful that I've been, I've had the privilege of doing ministry here for many years with very, very dear friends. It's a really wonderful gift. I'm an, I'm an aunt. I'm Auntie Lauren uh, to two precious little boys that I probably have talked about a whole lot. I'm a Philly sports fan. That's on your bingo card. Uh, <laughs> Big time Eagles fan. I got up in the middle of the night to watch them win the Super Bowl a few years back. Um, and we're pulling for a Phillies World Series this year. So we'll see what the Lord gives us. But uh, not, I, I, I like to say that Philly sports has helped make my faith strong. <laughs> but that's okay. Harper, Bohm, all of them. Gotta love them. Anyway, uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Graham, and, uh, Graham Bergen and I are very dear friends. We've worked together in director positions for a long time now. And throughout the year, we talk quite a bit. And 
uh, I'd say somewhere mid spring, maybe early March, late February, he called me and said, I think I've found the theme verse for Cheeky this year. And I was like, okay, interesting. And when he said second Chronicles, I have to admit, part of my brain went boop. <laughs> I, I study at a seminary, but I'm studying counseling. So like Hebrew, not some, it's something I enjoy, but it's not something I'm necessarily good at. But when he started to talk about this word chesed, and I wish that other, if, if you guys know how to say it better than I do, please just translate in your mind. But you know what I'm talking about, right? You've heard it enough times by now. Um, that really got my attention. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time there today because I really think it points us to the gospel more than anything else. Um, I did a little bit of research and I found this really cool definition of hesed that helped me understand it a little bit better. We know that it's hard to define in English. We know that it is difficult to put a finger on. And if you've studied other languages at all, you also know there's other words like that too. But this one is so central to what we believe um, as the people of God that I think it's really important to spend some extra time there. So one wise theologian actually said that uh, chesed is all of God's positive attributes directed towards us and beyond the confines of duty. So it's all of his positive attributes, all of God's positive attributes, which is like everything <laughs> who he is. It is the person of God directed towards us and beyond the confines of duty. And I sat and thought about that for a while and I thought, you know, like how much do I do in my life because I have to? The counsel I supervise the counselors here. They will tell you <laughs> they have task matrices. <laughs> they have tables that they have charts. They have lots of things that they do. We talk about counselor duties. And we laugh about the word a little bit, and that's fine. But we, they have counselor duty that they have to do because they signed up to do this. I have things that are on my schedule because I signed up to do this. God doesn't direct his character and his nature and his love towards us because he has to. He does it because he wants to. And that is intrinsic to who he is. Let that sink in for a minute. I spend a lot of my life, I'm a student too, so a lot of us are getting ready to graduate. Lord willing, May 2025. Who else class of 2025? Okay, awesome. Really looking forward to sharing that with you guys. Um, as I look at my life as a student, I have to say, like, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to not being a student anymore. I'm looking forward to not having a lot of the, th the constraints in my life that are part of that, and yet, I will have a choice after that. I don't, there's going to be a lot that I will not have to do out of obligation or duty. And yet that is who God is. And by making some of those choices, we get to learn more about that. I could talk about that for forever, but I'd like us to keep that idea. I wouldn't say it's solid enough to be like a total definition of chesed. And I don't have a, you know, DMA or PhD or MDiv or DMIN behind my name yet. So <laughs> um, I would say listen to those who are a little more qualified than me. And yet, I think it helps us to kind of get this all-encompassing idea. Mercy, love, loving kindness, steadfast love. That one I love too. Steadfast love. Do you and do I exercise steadfast love? towards those in our lives. I was sitting at a great table of people and I would say everybody around that table does a pretty great job and yet we fall short because we are human, right? And yet I'm grateful for the part of God that I've experienced through them. Steadfast love. It's impossible to do it all the time because we're human and yet we can learn through the process. How many of you would say we've learned something this week? Show of hands. Okay, I want you to turn to somebody next to you, and I realize now everybody's gonna turn to the right, maybe don't do that, but turn to someone around you and share something you have learned. What has your process been like this week? Go ahead, share. <laughs> Let's keep this brief, please. I love that that, spot, that conversation started so easily. That's beautiful. Please continue that conversation later. Don't forget, put a kind of bookmark that. 
In my uh, new field of psychology and counseling, we talk about the process of change a lot. In fact, in some of my earliest classes, there was this question that came up a lot, and it was, is change possible? Can people change? And when you live long, if you've lived long enough, and many of you, probably most of you have, you know that there are examples of both in our lives. Sometimes we look at that teacher and we're like, that's just how they are, right? And then we look at our friends and we're like, man, they've really grown. The process of change, as long as there is life, there is hope. And wherever there is life, I believe that change is possible. And so I want to encourage you that no matter where you are this week, change is still possible. <laughs> Growth is possible. And with that, not just because of the effort that you put in, but because of that chesed love of God directed towards you. We are asked to do so many things in life. There's so much that we have to do and need to do. We follow traffic laws, hopefully. We, fulfill, we, we live according to the laws of the land and wherever we, wherever we happen to live. I can tell you Germany has some funny ones, but it's okay. We live according to the laws of the land. When we're there, we sort our trash. We don't run our washing machines certain hours. It's fine. We live according to that law, and yet because we have the love of God directed towards us actively, we have that power behind us. We are able to fulfill those things. And not just that, but how about loving our neighbor? And not just the one who might be quote unquote easy to love, but the one who's maybe a little bit harder and maybe the person who walks into the class and you're like, okay, there's that person in my class this year, all right. Because of the chesed love of God directed towards you, you can in turn direct that love towards other people. It is important to know that God himself is not passively loving. He doesn't wake up someday and be like, or each day and go, all right, I got to start the love engine. I got to start that going. I got to press that button in my mind. It is who he is. He is many things. But this chesed love pulls it all together. So I want to look at the passage that Graham has chosen for us. And um, this is 2 Chronicles 5, and I'm actually going to read 11 to 14. So if you have your Bible, I'd invite you to turn there. And pay attention to what sticks out from you at the text, and I'll point you to some of my thoughts. 2 Chronicles 5, starting at verse 11. The priests then withdrew from the holy place. I'm reading out of the New International Version, so your version might be a little different than mine. I apologize for that. The priests then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there consecrated themselves, regardless of their divisions. All the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Hermon, Jedithan, their sons and relatives, stood on the east side of the altar dressed in fine linen and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. The trumpeters, the musicians, joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, the singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. What a scene. <laughs> How incredible. The first couple times I read it through, I was like, I don't even have fully formed thoughts. I just need to wrap my brain around what that must have looked like. Have you ever been stopped in your tracks by the love of God? We see consecration. All the priests who were there, verse 11, they had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. They knew this was special. I want you for, for a moment to think back. What happened before this scene? It's rhetorical right now, but think back. Mo many of you have had Sunday school, have had Bible classes, have th had things like that, have interacted with people in your life who can tell you these things. Where had the people of Israel journeyed from to get to the promised land? Anybody know? Egypt, right. Long journey, a lot longer than it was supposed to be. And then they finally got to where they were supposed to go. And then it took even more time to settle in the different places and they had to divide up the land. And then the whole time there was this process of rupture and repair. God, God had this promise in front of them and they were gradually moving towards it. And then they would mess up. And we hear a lot about the things that the Israels did that were wrong. And then yet God still 
God still kept his promise to them. He still kept that chesed love actively working towards them. Maybe it didn't look the, uh, the way it could have, but he still fulfilled that promise. He was not limited by their seeming failure. He was not limited by their failure. So when they finally got to this point where they were settled, they were building homes. It's a pretty great sign of settling, right? Putting pictures on the wall, probably maybe buying some plants. <laughs> there were still steps to follow. God himself wanted a place and not just peripheral. He wasn't just going to be up on a hill somewhere waiting for them to come to him. Let's keep reading. And I want to just put the question to, to you. Where, what place was God asking to hold? Where was he asking to be? So first of all, the priests, they consecrated themselves. This was special. That's our first signal in this grouping of verses that there's something really important going on here. Verse 12, all the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Herman, Jedithan, their sons and relatives, there's a lot of people that are involved in this. Their lives are shaping around this event. They've consecrated themselves. The musicians are gathering. You know what that's like, right? You're getting ready for a concert tomorrow, which I cannot wait to hear. Uh, Miss Holland, don't remind us. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> You're going to be awesome. It's okay. Um, but there's preparation. Not only did they, have, did they gather, they had a place to stand. They, they wore special clothes. I'm guessing it probably wasn't black and white, but you know, fine linen. <laughs> um, it even tells us the symbols, the harps, the light. There, there are instrument descriptions that are given to us. I want you to just, I wanted to step back from this for a moment. I was kind of struck by this because, not because of, only because of the instruments that are mentioned here, but how much, how many times do we say about scripture, <laughs> and those who are a little closer to my age uh, can probably relate to this, we look at this and we go, I just wish God would have told us fill in the blank. I wish he, he might have given us a little more detail. This is not denying his perfection, it's simply because we want to know. <laughs> Um, sometimes I wonder, you know, why weren't we given more pictures of Jesus' childhood? We have that one time when he was in the temple and he wandered away from his parents. Why is that the thing he tells us? And yet it's there for a purpose. God can handle my questions. We were reminded of that this week. Thank you for that. And so I think it's okay to be curious. So why is it that there are things that we wonder about Jesus' childhood and yet here we're told what they wore? Blew my mind a little bit. I had a, a Sunday school teacher that used to say, it makes smoke come out of your ears. Definitely one of these moments, because it's about to come out of the temple. Um, <laughs> we're told what they wore, we're told where they stood. There's preparation given. What does it mean to prepare ourselves for service to God? And here is where I thought of all of you the most. Because that preparation is exactly what you are doing this week. God has reached towards each of you in so many ways in that chesed love, that love that is actively moving towards you at all times. And there were many circumstances in your lives that brought you to this moment and this place. And I want you to know there is no mistake in any of that. No matter how long or short ago you registered, you are supposed to be here. Not just because Shehi is great, we know, it's fine but because God wanted you here and there was something that he had for you. And maybe it's not just about this moment. What if it's about your future? What if he's preparing a place for you and he brought you here to prepare for that? It's what he does with me every summer. There's preparation involved. What is he doing in your life? How has he changed you? since being here. Maybe it's not just about what you learn in your ensemble. Maybe it's about the encouragement that uh, Mr. Potter brought to you this week. Maybe it's about the love and the attention and the sh careful shepherding of your coaches. Maybe it's the, it, the devotions that you've had with your counselors. I don't know, but I know that God does. And he is actively, actively, I cannot stress that enough, moving towards every single one of you. There's preparation involved. So then in verse 13, we see that the trumpeters and the musicians, 
joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord. So they'd consecrated themselves, they'd worn special clothing, they took their positions, they prepared, and now they joined in unison to fulfill the purpose of all of that, to give praise and thanks to the Lord. So I have a question for you. What event are we actually celebrating in this passage? <laughs> what exactly is going on? Does anybody know? This is not rhetorical. Lizzie. The temple kind of dedication of the temple. Yeah. Dedication of the temple. So if you know much about the way that Israel moved through the wilderness, you know that they had the tabernacle that they got up and they took with them. And there was so much intention and detail that went into that. It was this beautiful thing that they took with them wherever they went. But now that they're settled, God said, I want to be here. And I'm not just going to I'm not not just going to live in tents anymore. I'm going to have a permanent place in and among you. I don't know how often some of you have moved. Some of you may have moved uh, houses, excuse me, more frequently than others. My parents currently live in the family home that I was born in, literally. And one of the things that one of the ways that I know I am home with my parents, because I still go back occasionally, is by the pictures on the wall. There are, they, there are not, when I walk into the door, in the door, there's like nephew, my nephew's artwork because, you know, my parents are wonderful grandparents and they want to see that. But then on the wall, there are framed pictures of our family. There's framed pictures of my sister's artwork. She's a tremendous artist in addition to being an incredible mom. There are photos of my brothers as they've, and me. <laughs> High school graduation, still there, guys, 20 years ago. It's great. But there are framed photos on the walls. So if you think, I don't want to lessen any of this in importance, but if you think of it, it's like God walking into this house and saying, I'm hanging my photo here because I'm central to this. Because I brought you here, I love you, we are in relationship, and I'm putting my picture right here. And I think that's the key to all of it. When I look at this passage, I see the gospel and I see relationship. Because no matter what Israel did, no matter what anyone else may have done, failed, passed, whatever, God was moving towards them in active love. And I don't know about you, but active love is something that's part of relationship. <laughs> Think of your friends. Think of your significant others. Think of your family. How are you moving towards them actively in love, in those relationships? Think of that and multiply, multiply it times infinity. And that is the love of God towards you. So the Lord had given his people a place of belonging. And not just belonging, but purpose. He had given them a place to be, to live, to settle, to know him. And then he asked to have a central place in that. So my question for you and for me in this moment then is what might God be asking you? Is he asking for a central place in your life? For some of us, maybe he's our, we've already heard that question and we're actively pursuing it. Just know you're not alone in that process. I'm not alone in that process. He doesn't call us and then say, good luck. Because that act of love is still pursuing us all the days of our lives. And then I also want to ask, where do you and I, I, need, I wish I could look in the mirror as I say this and look at you guys, because I need to ask myself this as well. Where do you and I feel most compelled to resist him? Because it could be that that's the place that he's asking to be. In fact, I can guarantee you that it is. So as we come to the end of this week, I want to invite all of us to pay attention to those places. I've mentioned my nephew several times, um, but I want to bring them up one more time before I close because I learned so much about God's love for his people through those little boys. They're six and a year and a half, and so there's lots going on in their worlds. Um, Winston, the older one, loves car washes. He's obsessed. Um, and he had this birthday party a few months ago, and he wanted everything to like, be just so. And he's pretty particular. He was an only child for a little while. And so, you know, he's got, he's got some pretty strong ideas. And he's also related to me, so strong opinions. Um, and it's interesting as I watch his parents work with him, as I watch my sister parent Winston. Because what Winston does is he gets this idea, and he's like, I'm going to do this. 
And Carolyn, my sister, goes, now, Betty, here's what mama needs to, here's what, mama, what actually has to happen. This is what mama and daddy are going to do. There's resistance, but it's met with love and resolution and growth. That is how the Lord is with each of us. Some of you think, or might be thinking right now, you know, that's not how my parents are with me. And if that's you, I just want, I wish I could look every single one of you in the eyes and say, I'm sorry. But I want you to know that that does not at all change how God feels towards you. He loves you. He made you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And he moves towards you actively. And not only that, the biggest, the, the biggest thing, he did the biggest thing that anybody could do for anybody else. He came, he was fully man, is fully man, and fully God, and he lived just like you and me. We're told there's nothing that we experience that he's not experienced, that he feels. And as someone who's in a field that deals with emotions, that was just blowing my mind recently. He gets us. He can look at you and say, I understand. I wonder what it'd be like for you to hear that and accept that and receive it today. Because he doesn't just understand you guys. He came and he died, but he didn't stay dead. He came back to life. And not just because his dad said he had to, but because of you. Because of you and because of me. He knew he knew who you are. He knows who you are. He knows what your name is. And he loves you. You have had the opportunity this week to do some incredible things. I haven't gotten to hear much. I've heard a couple of your groups, and I just can't wait for your concert tomorrow because of the growth. But, and I use that word intentionally, if you were to leave here at the end of your time with us and not know who Jesus is, and not know that he died for you, that he rose for you, and that he loves you beyond any human comprehension, then we would have failed at our jobs. So please, please give that some thought. And if there are questions, my friends and I would love to talk to you. <laughs> so thank you for this time. Thanks for letting me share from my heart. Thank you for hearing all of us this week. Um, I'd love to pray for you before we head out into this day. Our good and gracious Father, we praise you for the love that you have always held and shown and, lo and lived towards your people. Sometimes there's judgment involved in that love because you're a righteous God, but you never, ever stop drawing us to you. And so, Father, I want to lift those in this room who might hold doubt or skepticism, who might be struggling to understand who you are. Lord, be near to each of those people today. You promise to never leave us or forsake us. You promise to be with us always, Lord. And so I pray, I pray that you would open eyes and hearts. I thank you for this time we've been able to share this week, this morning. Lord, I pray that you would fill every single person in this room, students, coaches, staff, with your strength. Empower them to do what you have called them to do this day. And I pray that together we would, our hearts would cry to you and say, you are good because your love, your chesed love, actively pursues us forever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.